right, let's go uh, answer some Bible questions. What do you say? All right. This is uh, one of the paintings I did recently, a little uh, rural scene. And so we're going to be here in the studio answering your Bible questions. Now, we got a lot of questions this uh, recently about uh, the tribulation, the millennium. I remember when I discovered years ago the book uh, Pre-Wrath Rapture. Uh, it challenged what I believed because I was raised to, uh, was taught pre-tribulational, pre-millennial doctrine. But I came to doubt everything I was taught and wanted to prove it for myself. So I uh, became a student of the Word. And uh, I, read, uh, I read more books, uh, things I didn't believe, than what I did believe. I, I found it more valuable to study people with different ideas than to try to study the ones that already believed what I did and simply to confirm my belief. So I, I got the Pre-Wrath Rapture by Rosenthal. And so I decided to just dismiss my views and uh, let him convince me of what he was saying. So I read it as one who would want to believe it. I felt that was the most objective way to do it. And I looked at every one of his arguments, and I got all the way through it. And when I say I read it, I mean I took a pen and I marked it and studied it and looked up all the verses. So I went through it a second time or immediately to make sure that I hadn't, hadn't missed anything and looked at it very carefully. And I concluded <laughs> Rosenthal was off of his rocker. He just totally missed the words of God. In fact, what I discovered was that he went Bible shopping. There were passages that he couldn't deal with that taught things different from what his position was. And so he, he searched through the 300 and something English Bibles and found one rare one that agreed with the position he wanted to take. And so he didn't just use one version. He skipped around the different versions because they're not alike. They're all different. They have to be at least 10% different uh, in order to get a copyright on them. And that's the purpose, to get a copyright and sell books. And so he would find one that suited his position. And so <laughs> I dismissed the pre-wrath rapture simply because it's not biblical. Uh, it does not make biblical sense, and it just overlooks so much Scripture. So uh, I'm pre-tribulational, pre-millennial, and I have good reasons. So we're going to answer the question people have been asking, why is the Bible so hard to understand? There's some people believe pre-trib, some mid-trib, some post-trib, some no-trib at all. Some premillennial, postmillennial, all millennial, and then there's that panmillennial. It'll all pan out. I don't know what position to take. And so, which one is true? Which one is the correct position? Uh, it's hard to understand. Why is the Bible not clear? Why doesn't God just have a little section of theology and He says, "Okay, the correct position is," and then He delineates the correct position? Uh, why is it difficult to understand? That's what I'm going to answer. Or put it another way: Why isn't the Bible clear about the rapture and second coming? Why do some people say this verse teaches the rapture? Some people say it teaches the second coming. And then uh, the people who have a rapture position, there seem to be verses that contradict them. And then people have a pre-tribulational, pre-rapture uh, uh, position, or people have a post-tribulational rapture position. Uh, all of them seem to have verses that contradict them. So it's like you've got a lot of these confusing passages that say different things about the supposedly same event. So why is that so? Well, this, this is going to be fun to answer. You're going to see some things you never saw before. You're going to see with clarity things you've never understood. All right. The reason the Bible is confusing is because it was written to be confusing. Jesus spoke so as to confuse. The Bible is written to do two things. Number one, conceal truth. And number two, reveal truth. In other words, it's written in code. If you received a message in code written to someone else, you'd look at it and say, this is confusing. It doesn't make any sense. That's because you're supposed to be reading every eighth word, not every word. So that's code. Uh, sometimes codes are binary. Sometimes they come across other ways. Well, the Bible has its own code, its own unique usage of words and phrases that can be broken, that are intended to be broken. You're intended to understand. You're intended to get the key of knowledge and interpret the Bible. But uh, listen to what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2, 7. He said, we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom. In other words, God has hidden his wisdom, wrapped it up in a mystery, which God ordained before the world unto our glory. So Paul admitted, in fact, the word mystery appears 27 times in the New Testament. It all refers to things that God has kept secret 
and has parceled out that truth to people who have his spirit, to people who believe his word, and kept that truth concealed from people who don't believe. So the Bible is a beautiful code, and uh, you're going to have the key of knowledge. Now, Jesus also answered the question. The disciples came unto him, saying, Why, why speakest out unto them in parables? This is Matthew 13, 10. So the disciples didn't understand a lot of what Jesus said. They made that clear. They, they were always asking him to explain that to us. So they said, Why are you speaking to them in parables? Why aren't you plain? Why aren't you straightforward? He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries, there's that word again, of the kingdom of heaven, but them it's not given. So the answer to their question, why aren't you clear? Why are you speaking in parables? His answer was because it's not given unto them to understand the things I'm saying. You're supposed to understand it, but they're not. For whosoever hath to him shall be given, that who is knowledge, will be given knowledge, who, that he'll have more abundance, but unto whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken away, even that he hath. So the Bible is written to, <laughs> to take away what you think you know and leave you devoid of understanding if your heart's not in the right place, uh, if you don't have the key of knowledge. Wherefore, speak out to them in parables, Jesus said, because seeing they see not, they, 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 they look, they see, but they don't see. Hearing, they hear not, they hear the words, but they don't hear it. Neither do they understand. People say, well, I don't understand. Well, that's a self-indictment to say you don't understand. That's an admission of a failure to investigate or a heart that's unwilling to believe. He said, blessed are your eyes to the disciples, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. So the disciples did see and hear and understand, and still they do today. Now, in John 16, 25, he said, these things have I spoken unto you in Proverbs. Jesus said to the disciples, But the time cometh when I shall no more speak unto you in Proverbs, but I shall show you plainly of the Father. So Jesus confessed here that he wasn't being plain. He was wrapping up the truths in Proverbs so that even his own disciples were missing some of the points. His disciples said unto him, Lo, now thou speakest plainly. In other words, they say you hadn't been speaking plainly up until now but you just did. And uh, you'd have to read that whole context, John 16, 25 through 29, and, and, and greater than that to get it all. Now, Matthew eleven twenty five. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth. I love it. Uh, now, he's thanking the Father for what? Because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent. Uh, Jesus thanks God, the Father, that he hid these truths, the truths that are found in the book of Revelation. This painting that I did, this is a reproduction of about an eight, nine foot long painting. So he said, I thank you that you hid these things from the wise and prudent. Why isn't the book of Revelation easy to be understood? Because it's written so as not to be easy. It's written with code. The book of Daniel is a code breaker for the book of Revelation. The book of Zechariah is a code breaker. Habakkuk is a code breaker. Psalms is a code breaker. Even the book of Genesis are code breaking books that open up to us the meaning of the book of Revelation. So it's not supposed to be easy to get. It's like I, uh, people have these uh, hunts where they hide things and they have these little clues and and uh, people go around from clue to clue to finally come up with the prize. The, Bi the Bible is, is written, so you'll have to investigate. It's character building to do so, and it's also a whole lot of fun to discover for yourself the great truths of the Word of God. He said, you've hid these things from the wise and prudent and has revealed them unto babes. Just people with simple minds like children, they understand them. Even so, Father, so it seemed good in thy sight. So <laughs> here's the disciples and Jesus confessing to the Bible being written in mysteries. Now, so what is the key to deciphering the Bible? Jesus said unto Luke eleven fifty two, Woe unto you lawyers. So he's talking to the smart guys. For you've taken away the key of knowledge. That's not very complimentary. You entered not in yourselves, that's into the kingdom of heaven, 
and them that were entering in you hindered. So he said the smart lawyers, a lawyer in the, this sense was one who studied the law of God, one who studied the Moses and the Old Testament writings. Uh, most of these guys had it memorized from beginning to end. They knew every word, jot, and tittle that was in the Bible. You take out one little jot and they'd know that it was missing and <laughs> upset them very greatly. And yet he said, you took away the key of knowledge. You didn't go in, you missed it, you didn't unlock the door. After, with all that knowledge, they didn't have the key. So what was the key? Well, p different people have speculated, and I, I can't say for certain, but I know one thing that's the key. They, they had a failure to understand the difference between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. You see, there are eight kingdoms. In fact, I wrote a book, and I remember to bring it with me. I wrote a book called Eight Kingdoms, and it goes into great detail showing you the difference between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. And uh, I've got side-by-side uh, -side graphs and charts and diagrams showing you the scriptures in parallel, uh, showing you parables that are alike but different, explaining how the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven are different. The disciples didn't know that. And if you don't know the difference between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven, you're certainly going to be confused about all of these events. Because the kingdom of God is here. See where I've written the kingdom of God? The kingdom of heaven is here during the great tribulation. The kingdom of heaven was back here before the cross offered. The kingdom of God came on the day of Pentecost and will exist up until the rapture when the kingdom of heaven begins again. If you don't know the difference, you're going to have a lot of trouble. All right? Uh, now, there are two... The, the Bible is confusing... <laughs> For this reason, many, but let me give you several. Number one, there are the, 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 the apostles and the Pharisees and lawyers were confused about two things, the first coming and the second coming of Christ. When they read the scriptures, they read of Christ coming as a child, but they also read of him coming as a king to reign and to conquer that's why the disciples said unto Jesus, Will thou at this time restore again the kingdom unto Israel? They were expecting a fight. They were expecting a war. They were expecting him to conquer the nations and subdue their enemies and, and give them freedom. Give me liberty or give me death. They were libertarian patriots and they wanted to be freed from the dictates of a wicked Roman empire. So the Bible seemed to promise that. And yet it, it talked about a suffering, sacrificial lamb. So they didn't understand the difference between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. And so they were confused because the Bible predicted two comings, and they took it to be one. Now, Peter on the first day of Pentecost uh, says this, But this is they which was spoken by the prophet Joel. So he's going back to Joel. Now he quotes Joel. So he's describing the event with the many languages that the people are speaking in. He said, Joel described this. It shall come to pass, Joel said, in the last days, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on the servants and handmaidens will I pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Now, all that, was obviously taking place on the day of Pentecost. But then that's verse 18. Verse 19, the very next verse, Joel goes on and says, and Peter's quoting it, I will show wonders in heaven above, signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. Now, that, that hadn't happened, and it certainly wasn't happening on the day of Pentecost. There was no blood, fire, and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness. Got it painted right there and right here. And the moon before the coming of the great and notable day of the Lord. So here's the coming. And also, uh, down here at the end of the millennium is the coming of the great and notable day of the Lord. So they were confused about that. And it shall come to pass that whoso shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So Peter read the scriptures, and the scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures, described the first coming with the uh, 
coming of Jesus Christ and the coming of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. And it immediately jumps and describes the second coming in wrath, blood and fire and smoke. Now, Peter probably at that time still didn't understand the difference. He too was confused about the two comings of Christ. Now, you can understand why that would create confusion if you took that to be uh, all happening at one time. Now, there are two creation counts that people conflate, and that confuses people. The Bible in the book of Peter talks about the world then being overflowed with water, and they think that's Noah's flood. They don't realize that there was a flood before Noah's flood. There was a flood before Genesis chapter 1, verse 3 and following, before the six days of creation. There was a flood that destroyed this earth. Jeremiah talks about it. But uh, if you don't understand the two creation accounts, then you won't understand the two floods, Noah's flood and the pre-flood. And then there, there are two testaments people conflate. You've got a lot of Judaizers today that don't know the difference between the Old and the New Testament. Some of them want to live in the Old Testament, some the New, some kind of in between somewhere. So there's a conflation of the two testaments. There's also a, a conflation of eschatological, that's a, a word I learned in college, don't use it much, eschatological, end time study. Uh, okay, the first coming is confused with the rapture of the church, confused with the rapture of the tribulation saints at the end of the tribulation, uh, they're confused with the second coming of Christ, and confused with the end of the world judgment that occurs after the thousand year millennial reign of Christ upon the earth. So when, when, you, don't, when you don't rightly divide these different comings, these different eschatological events, then it's going to be real confusing. We're going to show you in the scripture uh, them side by side. And then people confuse the judgments that are to come. The Bible speaks of the judgment seat of Christ, which is up here. It also speaks of the great white throne judgment, which is right here. It's written there, great white throne judgment. And they confuse it with the, ju uh, the judgment seat of Christ, great white throne judgment, and then with the judgment of the nations, that occurs at the end of the tribulation when he separates the sheep from the goats. If you try to put all those together, it's going to look contradictory and make the Bible hard to understand. But if you rightly divide the word of truth, it stops being difficult. Now, uh, in fact, Peter's, uh, Timothy says, uh, Peter says this to Timothy, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Uh, a lot of people spend their whole life studying the Bible and then they end up ashamed uh, with the false doctrines they come up. He said, rightly dividing the word of truth. Wow, rightly dividing. That means that you need to divide the Old Testament from the New Testament. You need to divide the gospel of the kingdom of heaven Jesus preached and the disciples preached in Matthew 5, 6, and 7 from the gospel that Paul preached and that was preached by the apostles after the resurrection. You need to divide the rapture from the second coming. You need to divide present tribulation from future great tribulation. The Bible is full of similar but different events that need to be divided into the proper place uh, and so designated in your thinking if you're going to understand the Word of God. Now Matthew 13, 40 says this. This is an example of the uh, uh, end of the age, end of the world events. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be at the end of this world. So if you think there's just like one coming and one judgment, what you have here is at the end of the world, the angels go out through the whole earth, we'll see in another passage, and gather together all the sinners and burn them in the fire, and leaves the righteous on the earth. He said, the Son of Man shall send forth his angels. They shall gather out of his kingdom. Wow. The, the kingdom, if you don't know the difference in the kingdoms, you'd have the angels going into the churches, gathering out of the kingdom all things that offend. Christians that offend in the church would be gathered out. Well, there's people who actually believe that, interpret that that way. They believe you can lose your salvation, 
that uh, the angels will come and pull you out of the church and pull you out of the kingdom of God and say you didn't, you weren't faithful enough. Uh, gather out of his kingdom all things that offend in them which do iniquity and cast them to, into a furnace of fire. Now, if you understand that there's eight kingdoms, you know that Christ's kingdom right here during the thousand years is different from the kingdom of God, different from the kingdom of heaven, that during this Christ kingdom, when Christ is king over the earth, there will be sinners on the earth during that time. And at the end of the kingdom of heaven, Christ's kingdom, the angels will come down and take the sinners out of the world. Now, you and I will have survived the great tribulation in heaven in glorified bodies and come back. We will be ruling and reigning with Christ for a thousand years and in glorified bodies. So we won't be at risk of being taken out of the kingdom. But those who survived, who refused the mark of the beast and survived the tribulation and went into the kingdom of heaven, the Christ kingdom at that point, and had babies. And the babies who died, like you have a child that died, be raised and grow to maturity during the kingdom of heaven and have a chance to respond to Christ during that Christ kingdom up on the earth. So, He's going to send his angels and gather out of his kingdom, literally his kingdom, all things that offend and those that do iniquity and burn them in fire. And what's left in the kingdom of heaven are the righteous. <laughs> you couldn't square that with any rapture passage. That's totally a different event. And then uh, in Matthew 13, 29, similarly, he said, uh, uh, let both grow together into the harvest. At the harvest, I will say unto the reapers, gather ye first the tares and bind them into bundles to burn them. The reapers are the angels. So the man has a field full of wheat. Tares have come up in the wheat. He has another parable about that. And the first thing the farmer does is before he tramples the tares down into the wheat, or gets it mixed up in the cutting process, and I've watched the Amish do this, they'll go out into the field with a knife and they will have a sack and they will cut these seeded tares. They will cut them and put them in a sack. They'll walk carefully through the whole field getting all the tares out of the field. And they won't go and lay them on the side because they don't want the seeds to get back in the garden. And they'll take them, they'll put them in a pile and they'll burn the tares. Now the wheat, the, the wheat field is standing perfectly purged. That's what's that's not the rapture, obviously. Uh, it's not the righteous taken out. It's the tares taken out, which occurs at the end of the millennial reign of Christ up on the earth. Bind them, into, bind them in bundles. Now, he said that's the end of this world. The question was, what happens at the end of this world? So the world doesn't end until after the 1,000-year reign of Christ. And then it's, it's burnt up, as you see here, earth destroyed. And then there's a new heavens and a new earth created. That's at least 1,007 years away, uh, this end of this present earth. Could be much longer. I don't know. Uh, then in Matthew 13, 49, he says, so shall the be wicked be at the end of this world. In, in, in other words, it's not just the end of the world. It's the end of this particular world. There will be a new one created and sever the wicked from among the just. Now, Second uh, Peter 3.10 speaks of it. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise. So here is the heavens passing away with a great noise. And the elements shall melt with a fervent heat. That's obviously not the rapture which is followed by all of these events in seven years, it's obviously uh, something much more cataclysmic. Seeing then that these things, uh, did, did I miss something? Yes, let me read that again. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the elements shall pass away with a great noise. Heaven shall pass away with a great noise. And the elements shall melt. That means that the 128, 30, whatever it is, elements will all dissolve into nothingness. And the earth also and all the works that are therein shall be burned up. So this whole earth is going to be burnt into an unrecognizable conglomerate of elements. Uh, 
Seeing then that these things shall be dissolved, it's the very dissolving of the Adam, uh, what manner of person ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness? He said, <laughs> when you think about this world is going to cease to exist, don't buy stock in it. Don't place your hope in it. Don't make this your future. Looking for and hastening unto the coming of the day of the Lord, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved. So even the atmosphere is going to burn up. And the elements shall melt with a fervent heat. Nevertheless, you, according to his promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. So I painted here this new earth, the seven new things. My uh, handbook that goes with this chart tells you about the seven new things. And then, now here is a different passage. This is the rapture. The rapture taking place right here where the living saints are taken up out of their graves and taken straight on into heaven. The sinners are left behind. They're not gathered together at tares first and bound in bundles. Sinners are untouched. They go into the tribulation. Okay, Here it is in um, 1 Thessalonians 4.14. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, them also which sleep in Jesus, that's the people, Christians are in their graves, but their spirits are present, not their bodies, but just their spirits are present with Christ in heaven. Those which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent, this is a vent going up into heaven, Will not go in the will not be raptured up prevent ahead of time those others will not prevent them which are asleep that's the dead in Christ uh, for the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel and the dead in Christ shall rise first so the graves open up first so if I'm standing in a graveyard and I've got one here on my property my mama and stepdad is buried in it and other friends and people have died some of them younger than me, and uh, got a nice little graveyard here. And I, I drive by it a half a thousand times a day, my little buggy, maybe more, and uh, I go up and cut the grass. So I imagine myself up there cutting the grass, and the rapture takes place. Some of those graves date back to the Indians. They're real old uh, hand-carved stones or just big rocks piled up, a carn of rocks piled up. And uh, so the graves will actually open. The ground's actually split open. And out of the ground are going to come the bodies of these dead saints. Some of them have been dead 200 years, maybe. And their bodies are going to come up, and they're going to be, and I'm going to be watching them go, and whoop, there I go, right behind them. And so they'll come out of the grave in time enough for me to get a look at them, <laughs> and maybe wonder if I made it, you know. <laughs> but I know I will. But, I mean, here you are, you're watching the rapture take place. Uh-oh, uh oh there it goes. Uh -oh. And then I'm gone. So get taken up. We which are alive remain to come in the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore comfort you one another with these words. So the, speaking to Christians, the Bible said, be comforted by the end time events. Let it be comfort to you. Because this is the way it ends. As a thief in the night, unexpectedly, as they were in the days of no eating, drinking, marriage, and giving in marriage, knew not till the flood came, took them all away, so shall it be. So un, unbeknowings, un, no, no indication, no signs, no warnings, no antichrist, nothing prophesied to precede it, a preeminent uh, coming of the Lord. That's <laughs> I'm looking forward to that, comforted by that. I'm encouraged by that. Uh, could be in the next three minutes, three seconds, three days. Now, if we were going to have to go through any portion of this tribulation, I wouldn't be comforted. I would say, man, this is getting close. I need to buy some more food. I need to get some more guns so I can shoot all the sinners. Uh, and a lot of Christians are that dumb. But I'm going to leave all my guns behind. I'm going to leave all my stored up food behind. I'm going to leave my gardens behind. And I'm just going to be gone. And it's Split second. And then all of this takes place. That's why it's confusing. It's because you've got two, 
two different events taking place, the rapture and the second coming. Now, Matthew 24, 3. And he sat upon Mount Olives, his disciples came unto him privately, saying unto him, Tell us what shall these things be, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? So their, their question was, when are these things about the destruction of the Mount, uh, temple going to happen? And what is the sign of thy coming? S- separate question. And what, when is the end of the world? Now, they thought that was all one event. See, they conflated these events. So Jesus is going to answer the question, three questions they asked. They didn't know they thought they asked one. And he's going to answer it. Okay. Uh, I'm not going to get every verse here. You can read Matthew 24 yourself. But he talks about uh, take heed that you don't be deceived. Many will come in my name saying I'm Christ. Uh, There'll be wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation, earthquakes, diverse places, famine, disease, SARS, uh, (laughs) COVID-19. I added that. Uh, they, sh- they deliver you up to be afflicted. They'll kill you. You'll be hated of all nations for my name's sake. That's already happening in Russia and China, North Korea. <clears throat> many false prophets shall arise, shall deceive many. Iniquity shall abound. Love of many shall wax cold. And then he says, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. Now that's not the end of the world, because he says, when you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. So he said, there'll be a sign of this end. You'll see what Daniel predicted when the Antichrist sets up an image of himself in the temple and demands people worship it. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. So in other words, these events precede the second coming. This is how the end of this age will take place. So he tells them to flee into the mountains. Now, you're not in Judea, so it wouldn't apply to you, obviously. Uh, For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. So that's the tribulation when so many people are dying. And he said, uh, be false Christ, false prophets. And then we come to verse 27. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth unto the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Now that's not what he just described above. That's not that lengthy description of Antichrist and wars and rumors of wars and difficulties and fleeing, going to the south, and uh, being uh, the uh, Antichrist sending out a flood, uh, the ground opens up, uh, God sent, opens up uh, the ground, swallows the flood, saves the Jews. So all those events are not like lightning shining out of the east and coming unto the west, which is the rapture. Who set where their server the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together immediately after the tribulation of those days. So there's your tribulation. And it it follows the lightning, Christ coming back like lightning, the skies opening up. After the tribulation of those days, and that's what he described above, shall the sun be darkened, The moon shall not give her light. The stars shall fall from heaven. And the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. So that's protracted events taking place in sequence. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And they and all the tribes of the earth shall mourn when they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. That's not like the lightning shining out of the east and unto the west. This provides a time for people to see signs of his coming, no signs for the rapture. But where are the signs? He just described that long list up there in the earlier part of the chapter. When the Antichrist shows up and the temple's desecrated and the Jews are persecuted and 144,000 are sealed, uh, like we got here, right here, 144,000 sealed, chapter 14. Chapter 7 and chapter 14, I I forgot that. 
And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Uh, they sh uh, all the tribes of the earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man come in the clouds of heaven. Now, verse 31. And he shall send his angels. Now, this is not him. This is not Christ coming in the air. At this point, this is him. I mean, in other words, it's not the rapture where he makes this sudden appearance. Then shall he send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. So this is a post-tribulational rapture of those who were saved and died during this time. And then we read, now this is, this is in contrast. That, here we had three different events described. Here in contrast, listen to this, Matthew 13, 40. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be at the end of this world. End of this world. He didn't say at his second coming. He didn't say at the rapture. He said at the end of this world, the tares are gathered and burned in the fire. The Son of Man shall send his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom. Now that's the kingdom of heaven that will take place for a thousand years. All things that offend, and they which do iniquity. <clears throat> now think about if you tried to apply this to the rapture, the second coming. You'd have God coming down, Jesus coming down, sending his angels out, to gather out of his kingdom. That would be the church if you take it to be the kingdom of, of God. Now, if you don't know the difference between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven, you'd be real confused here. Because you'd have the angels coming down, going through all the churches, and gathering everybody <clears throat> that's offended or done iniquity, and casting them into a furnace of fire. And that's the first event that takes place at that coming. It's not a gathering together of the Christians or of the saints even. It's not a resurrection. It's the angels coming back and going through the kingdom, finding all the sinners, pulling them out, taking them to a judgment, the great white throne, where they're cast into the lake of fire. So you've got four different events, uh, eschatological events taking place here. And so if you don't understand the difference between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven, uh, then you're not going to understand the scriptures very well. But it's quite clear once you get a grasp of, pay attention, when he says the end of the world, he means the, uh, the end of the world, when the actual the world is burnt up here at that point. Uh, so when he says the end, that's not necessarily the end of the world. That can be the end of the tribulation, the end of the present age, it can be the end of, of anything that that he designates in the context. So uh, that's, this has been kind of lengthy, but we're going to go into some more scripture. In fact, we're going to go into every passage in the New Testament that deals with the second coming, the rapture, the tribulational rapture, the end of the millennium, the end of the age, the end of the world. Any of those passages, we're going to deal with every single one of them. You're going to see them in their context, and it's going to make an awful lot of sense to you. So that's all for now. <laughs>